Well, good morning, good afternoon and good evening wherever you're listening around the world. Hello and welcome to the Saturday, the 21st of July edition of EV News Daily. It's Martin Lee here with the news you need to know about electric cars and the move towards sustainable transport. And occasionally on a Saturday, I like to pause the news for a day and bring you an interview or maybe a behind-the-scenes look of the world around electric transport. Well, today, I'm going to take you to a company called Moixa. They're a British technology company founded in 2000. 2006 by Simon Daniel and Chris Wright, which focuses on energy innovation. Uh, they invent, they manufacture, and they distribute smart energy technology. And they are the UK's leading home battery company. Well, I sat down with their chief technology officer, Chris Wright, for a chat about how EVs can be part of a smart software solution to manage energy, how home batteries don't have to be quite as big as you think, and how we can use EVs for vehicle to grid and vehicle to home, plus many more things as well. I really hope you enjoy this interview as much as I enjoy doing it. It's a fascinating insight into some of that world around what we do, apart from just the cars themselves. Have a listen to this. So here we are in East London for a special of EV News Daily with Chris Wright. He's the Chief Technology Officer of Moixa. Uh, Thank you so much for inviting us down here on another very hot day in London, and you've been super busy, so I appreciate that. Thank you. No, really good to meet you guys. So I first heard of you on a Robert Llewellyn video when it was, uh, he simply, it was a passing mention, and he was like, there's this company in the UK, it's solar and storage, it's £5,000, it's all in one, it's brilliant, and I, I looked you up. So that is my first... That's how we first came across you guys. And I guess, is it fair to say that like, your first product was solar and storage consumer market? Or is that how it began? Tell me a bit more. Yeah, so, so I always kind of divide what we do into two things. So the first thing we do, and, the, and, and exactly as you say, where we started from, is making uh, an energy storage system to go in homes, which we typically install alongside solar panels. And so that has a sort of very simple primary purpose which is to uh, when you're out in the day at work the solar is producing lots of energy and if stop that just going out to the grid but store that for you and then when you come home in the evening and you're using energy and the sun is no longer out give that energy back to you and so it has a very simple sort of primary purpose but actually if you do that and it's an internet connected smart device then suddenly you've got lots of other things you can do and you can start saying okay well if i've got thousands and then millions of these things suddenly I've got the ability to turn up or turn down the consumption relatively instantaneously of millions of homes. Now that's interesting. Now that's something kind of like, okay, so now we can start to actually offer that back as a grid. So rather than turning on another fossil powered power station, actually we can just turn down the wick on a bunch of houses. That's kind of, that's smart. That's interesting. And that starts to be like where we go as a country. Because what we want to do is decrease our reliance on, 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 on fossil fuels, increase the amounts of renewables that we can use. And the way that we will do that is through being smart, deploying some of those technologies that got developed for the Internet that are really super smart and distributed. Then we've got the opportunity to really do that. And, and the thing that's really interesting to us is that actually that needn't look like big tech. right? That actually can be home by home, lots of homes all together communicating aggregated back to make something really big as a community and that sort of you start to have a really interesting way that you could you could really work with the energy system so that's the first thing we do and i've kind of implied the second thing we do right (laughs) which is that actually in order to do that you need some really smart software so we we make a, a smart software platform called gridshare which is what enables all of that smart so all of our batteries in the field talk to that grid share platform and now increasingly so we just we've actually got guests here today from partner company in 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 japan itochu we've got thousands of batteries going in about a thousand a month of their hardware not our hardware their hardware where um, we're then controlling them and and, and optimizing the value that they deliver to the customers and, and then potentially later making them available for these grid services so and that's all on the software side nothing to do with our hardware so the way that we see these devices attached to our, our software platform is not that they have to be a specific type of thing, but we're very interested in anything that looks like storage attached to a home or attached to, to a business. And that includes electric vehicles, because effectively you've got a, a big storage device attached to your house and making that available is something that's very, very interesting. 
So, so at consumer level, people who buy electric cars tend to be more interested in things like solar and storage and lowering their carbon footprint, how they can drive on more green green miles. So they're, uh, they're more interested in this already. So one of the things that we always get asked on the podcast, we talk about cars and they always talk about how big's the battery. Um, but in terms of home storage, solar and storage at the moment, maybe apart from the Tesla Powerwall, the actual battery sizes compared to a car are quite small. Of course, in a car, you've got maybe 30, 40, 50, or 60 kilowatt hours of storage. So are the home battery sizes, two or three kilowatts hour at the moment, almost a stepping stone to using those bigger batteries, or, or do they play a part in part of the ecosystem? The context in which you see the size of that, of that battery is in proportion to the amount of energy that a home uses every day. So typically in the UK, a home uses... 8 to 10 kilowatt hours of energy. So having a battery which can provide a third of that and then another third perhaps comes directly from solar suddenly becomes, that makes sense. If your primary purpose of that battery is to time shift when you're using energy, to take energy from the sun, then then you really need that to be providing value all year round. And so the trick with how you size the battery is to look at how often can you charge that up fully from the sun? So if you have like a 15 kilowatt hour battery, then the chances are you'll only really max that out a few days in any one year. Whereas if you have a three kilowatt hour battery, like it's much smaller, but you're going to max out how much you use it every day. And so that becomes the metric by which we do. Now, as the cost of batteries comes down, and it is coming down really, really quickly, then it's quite possible that the sort of the size that makes sense will will gradually go up. In fact, this summer we're launching a five kilowatt hour model, which will be more cost effective per kilowatt hour because actually, you know, we're riding that wave of of the costs coming down, which has happened with solar and is now happening with with battery storage, and and we're really keen to kind of like you know push those costs down. The other thing, obviously, which is which is really interesting around electric vehicles, is that there's the potential to actually use the battery in the vehicle so i actually have uh, an electric vehicle charger at my house where i can actually power my house from the car which is not a terribly usual thing in the uk it's just a kind of technology that's just beginning to be investigated right so with um the new nissan leaf the 40 kilowatt hour one yeah. they made a big deal about v- vehicle to grid v to g with that and then what a lot of people didn't realize that even with the first two i think nissan leafs the 24 and 30 kilowatt hour battery in japan because the utility companies enabled it actually those early leafs were already doing vehicle to grid so people were quite surprised to know that although it's new in the uk and very new it's been going on elsewhere and it's it really it needs people to be enabling that technology yes i mean japan is really interesting around this stuff so it turns out that while like a handful of people in the UK perhaps have, you know, vehicle to grid um, technology. And in fact, I think it's worth making a sort of distinction between like vehicle to grid, where you might take energy from your car and push it out to the grid and maybe sell it back to the energy companies. That would be vehicle to grid or vehicle to home or vehicle to building where actually you're using the energy in that battery in your car to power your home. So the two are kind of slightly different kind of use cases. And the thing that's really taken off a lot in in Japan so far is vehicle to home, where around 7% of Nissan Leaf owners, so that and that's quite a high proportion, have already bought a vehicle to home charger. So they're already doing that. And which is also in Japan, there's quite a concern around if there's a tsunami or an earthquake or something that they'll be cut off from power for days and days. And actually, you could power your home for nearly a week mm. from that. So that's pretty interesting. Suddenly, that's actually in the UK, that's, that's harder for various reasons around grid. But actually, the, the ones that are deployed in Japan also have this kind of backup functionality. So if there's a big power cut and you've got your car plugged in, mm. then you can kind of continue in your home powered by the car for quite some time. So that's, that's a really interesting kind of like dynamic that's coming on. And it's becoming like really like something that people do. Since the first time that I visited your website 
I don't know, a year and a half, two years ago when it was that kind of like, oh, I could get, because I want solar on my house. We've just moved into a new house. We're going to be there long term. The maths finally make sense because we're going to be there eight to 10 years. Uh, and then with EV, it all starts to make sense as well in terms of a long term investment. So since I first saw your website when it was really, and I was interested in solar and storage, that's kind of cool. Then when I knew I was coming back to see you guys, on your online now, there seems more of an emphasis on how you make that happen. I mean, you still offer those products, but there seems to be more that you're talking about now about the software and the grid share that enables that to happen. A little bit less emphasis on the hardware. Is that fair? That's absolutely fair. And I think that's driven by the stages through which we, we've gone as a company. So we're very proud of our hardware. It's, it's we think, the best one that's available. And we're, we're rolling it out to lots of, of, of customers right now alongside solar. But at the same time, that's a market that's changing really quickly. Other people are coming to market. And our software is totally world-beating. As demonstrated by kind of, you know, Itochu and others kind of like utilizing that as the, I mean, the way they put it is they, we need the Moix's brain for our, for our system. And so in that context, kind of like, you know, we are actually now using the software against other people's hardware. So perhaps two years ago, it was much more about, okay, so the, the platform is something that enables our hardware. Now, our hardware is one of the platform, one of the sort of hardware solutions that gets enabled by our platform, but we're not exclusively, the platform is not exclusive to our hardware. So that's maybe the change. So we're now kind of, we're maybe pulling them apart a little bit and thinking about them slightly separately. And so that's maybe why we're kind of making more of a, of a deal around that. Because, I mean, particularly when, you know, um, a company of, of, of Itochu's size is rolling out about a thousand systems a month to customers in Japan. And so that's a really compelling scale of growth. So EV drivers uh, are always uh, one of the things that are leveled at them uh, is about the, you know, the carbon footprint and the CO2 of the cars they drive and people compare it to the emissions of combustion vehicles as well. So a couple of quick fire questions. Now we've got an expert in the room today, not necessarily about Moixa, uh, but in terms of people driving their cars and on the energy they drive it on. In the UK, the government here still set on five or six more nuclear power stations a, a recent infrastructure even this week piece of advice was we need one more from your perspective how are we going to be powering the uk in five ten or fifteen years personally i think that the 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 nuclear power stations are not terribly good value for money like i think with that much money you could be spending that on extra renewables and storage capacity at large scale in the UK, you get much better value for money. And actually, if you look at the price that of, of energy from renewables globally, not just in the UK, that's just reducing and reducing. So, you know, the, the government has agreed to a price of £93 a megawatt hour for energy from the nuclear power station Hinkley C. And actually, the average cost of um, energy in the UK is more like £40. So we're going to be paying more than twice what it actually costs for that energy from that nuclear power station. And in fact, that's only going to get worse because the cost of renewables like offshore wind power is actually lower than that average on the whole. So I think we would have been better off doing more renewables and storage to balance that out. Um, you know, there are other views there. But I mean, one thing that, that we do on our side is is... We, we run a kind of optimization engine. So the software is there going, okay, what can I do to reduce the cost to the customer? Now, the cost is only one place to stand. So we can say, we could equally change that metric and say, I'd like to reduce my carbon footprint of the energy that I use as hard as possible. And then we'll, we'll use our machine learning to generate that and we just stand in a slightly different place we model we can we can model the kind of energy carbon intensity of um, the uk from the grid and from your solar panels on your roof and understand like okay what's the best time to charge around carbon which might be slightly different from what the best time is to charge around cost yeah Elon Musk and Tesla talk about their neural net and machine learning and, and all those kind of things to make the experience better every day. We hear a lot about AI 
but yeah. no one apart from you understands what it really is. How does AI in this future energy environment work for us and the consumer and for you as well? And and how do we how do we use the technology there to to know will my house ever know I get home at half past six every day? So I better save some energy on my Moixa battery because he's going to cook dinner. Kind of, is that a really stupid thing to say? <laughs> no, that's exactly the heart of, 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 of this stuff. That's exactly where we stand. So, I mean, what we do is we use advanced computer software to learn the patterns of each person, each of our customers. We learn their patterns. We learn when they use energy. We learn when their roof generates energy. Like maybe they've got a tree that shades the panels at four in the afternoon. They don't make any energy at four in the afternoon. So we learn those patterns. And we learn also the pattern, like when do they plug in their car to charge it up? How much energy do they typically put into their car every day? So when we've done, we've learned all of those patterns with this software. Then we use another piece of software, which is then designed to go, okay, now I'm going to look at what I predict for tomorrow. So I'll take also weather forecasting data and calendars and all sorts of stuff like that. Add that all into a kind of clever piece of software, which then looks and says, okay, what's the best thing to do tomorrow? Because the key thing is you need to understand if there's not going to be any sun tomorrow, then I probably need to charge up in the middle of the night. But I don't, there's no point in waiting for the sun and then having find that. You need to know in advance. You have to predict that. And so that's, that's what we do. We predict what we think is going to happen tomorrow. And then we make a plan on that basis. Uh, and that's the sort of exactly, as you say, the essence of the sort of AI. And the, the point to take about, I mean, there's all sorts of scary AI as well, but this is really kind of around making something which is working on your behalf. So like an intelligent agent working for you um, and trying to make your life more efficient, better, uh, and, and just kind of ar and around your goals, but also kind of, you know, you should be able to tell it what your priorities are and it'll then optimize for that. Awesome. Well, th thank you so much for your time today. If people want to find out more about Moixa, where can they go online? If you go to moixa.com, you'll find stuff about us and then you can get in touch with us and we'd be delighted to hear from you. Chris, thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's been delightful to talk for you today. Well, I really did find that a fascinating chat with someone who's thinking way down the future on how we'll be using our electric cars and balancing the grid and using renewable energy and reducing our carbon footprint and all of those kind of things with some spectacularly smart solutions. Thank you, Chris and the Moixa team. Well, if you have an idea for a future weekend special, maybe your company would like to be on the podcast and you'd uh, like to say, come along and see what we do. Or maybe you know somebody or you know of a company that are doing really interesting things in the EV space or e-mobility. Well, drop me a line, and if I can, I will organise something in person or maybe over Skype or, or that kind of thing. The email address to get hold of me is hello at evnewsdaily.com. That is hello at evnewsdaily.com. In the meantime, you can also listen to every previous episode of the podcast. They're all on iTunes as podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, YouTube, TuneIn, Stitcher, and the blog at evnewsdaily.com. If you subscribe, well, then you get them first and free and automatically. And if in return for me doing this you can leave a little rate and review that really is the thing that uh, helps drive the show up the charts the algorithms all those kind of things i know it's a faff i know you're busy uh, well thank you so much for listening today come and say hi on the socials linkedin twitter and facebook search ev news daily have a wonderful day and i'll catch you tomorrow